Thank you, choir and Rob and our praise team today. If you will go ahead and take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 2 Corinthians. Go ahead and turn there today as we will be spending our remaining time in the Scripture in chapter 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I've entitled the message this morning, Have You Really Been Changed? Have You Really Been Changed? Pretty simple title but it is really a question that we've got to deal with today. And if we can answer it properly and appropriately in a positive way, uh, we're going to be able to see God's getting us ready to use us. If we haven't been changed, we're going to be able to see what he desires to do to get us ready where we can be used by him in great ways. So thank you today for being here. I pray you're here to hear a word from the Lord. I pray you've already heard that in the music portion. But now I especially pray that you will hear from the scripture today. What you doing sitting down? Get on up. Let's read some scripture and spend some time together here today. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 and you just follow along and I'll stop when the Lord says stop. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. We then as workers together with him... I also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience, in tribulation, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonment, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fasting, by purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not yet killed, as sorrowful yet also rejoicing as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own afflictions your own affections. Now in return for the same, I speak as to children, you also be open. Do not be unevenly yoked toward together with unbelievers, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, and what communion has light with darkness, and what accord has Christ with Biel? And Biel simply means the devil or person of lawlessness or what part has a believer with an unbeliever and what agreements have the temple have what arguments has the temple of God with idols for you are the temple you are the temple we are the temple of the living God as God has said I dwell in them and walk among them I will be their God and they shall be my people therefore he says therefore Come out from among them and be separated, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty in verse 1 of chapter 7. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Father, thank you so much, so much for the reading of your word today. And thank you, Lord, already just from the reading of your word, what you have challenged my heart, and I pray challenged the heart of many in this room with already. I pray that you will help us to look deeply in our hearts and be able to determine if we have been changed and if we have been changed in the way you desire us to be changed. Lord, if we have surrendered to the very things that will change us into your likeness to be who you've called us to be. 
Lord, as we look at our walk today, may you help us to honestly look individually, not necessarily at someone else's walk, but to look at our walk and see where we are and where, what we need and how we can receive what we need, even this morning as we hear from you. Lord, I have begged you today, and you know, and my prayers for you just to be here and to move in powerful ways like never before, that you would just get our attention, full undivided attention today without any distractions, none whatsoever in this room. And Father, even if there may be a distraction or two, that our minds would be so focused on what you want to say today that we would not even notice Father, I pray that we will see you here today and we'll see you, Lord, uh, with this cross that is a reminder of the depths of your love and the forgiveness of our sins. I pray that you will help me to stand behind this cross faithfully today and I pray, Father, the words that will be said will be said from you that you will give to me and I will properly speak them from my lips and from my tongue today. And I pray as we speak those words, hear those words, Lord, that all lives in this room, including myself, will be changed to be more like you. Thank you for what you're going to do. We love you, Lord. And I pray that's not a lie that we're telling here today. I pray that it is the truth and we will live it out and show it, not just by the way we live here, but how we're going to live when we leave this place throughout this week. Hear our words, Lord, and may we hear yours. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. One of the greatest questions and frustrations of ministry in my entire ministry, but not only my entire ministry, but those that are walking with Christ even in this room today and Maybe those of you who are participants involved in Bible study, those of you that are being a friend and are a friend maybe to someone else, maybe you're a parent here today. One of the greatest frustrations that I experience is probably some of the same frustrations that you experience is whenever we, when we see people who have seemingly made a profession of faith. Uh, now stay with me just for a moment. We, we've actually seen people that have made a profession of faith. They, they perhaps have walked down an aisle. They have professed faith in Jesus Christ who seems to have given their life to the Lord. And, and we've watched them begin a journey. We, we've watched them start walking in the way that is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, at some point in time, it's like they fall off the face of the earth. That's one of the most discouraging things and hurtful things I know in my ministry is to see that happen in people's life so, so many times, so often. We, again, you, you go to Sunday school class with them. You attend services with them. You've seen them get on fire for the kingdom of God, even in the church. And then all of a sudden, they just disappear. They're, they don't seem to be fa able to be found anywhere whatsoever. Now, we all know, all of us in this room know people like that, don't we? We know people just like that. It may be people in your own family. It may be people that you have been sitting with in a Sunday school Bible study class. And it may even be someone that used to sit next to you in the pew that you're sitting on today. And then before you know it, you start having this conversation later on. And your conversation goes something like this. Well, I wonder whatever happened to so-and-so. I wonder where they are and I wonder what they're doing. I, I have that question posed to me a lot from people that will ask me, well, I haven't seen so-and-so in a long time and they were so dedicated and, and, and involved in serving, but I haven't seen them in such a long time. Do you know where they are? Do you know what's going on? To me, that's one of the discouraging things in this day that we serve in ministry, people rejecting the faith that once claimed it wholeheartedly. Those that once said yes to the Lord and, and it seemed to be real and genuine. Uh, to me again, and I don't know how I can say it in a lot of different ways, it's one of the most heartbreaking and confusing, not just heartbreaking, but confusing things that, that I deal with in ministry on an ongoing basis, just as you do also here today. 
What would cause someone to come to a place where they made this decision to follow Jesus and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, then undo that decision weeks later, maybe months later, maybe a few years later, but, but it's done and you don't see them anymore. I want to give you just to begin with as we kind of get the motor running and warmed up a little bit today, I think there are two possibilities that we could close out to say, well, it's one of the two that's caused this to happen. And I want us to look at it in our heart. And then we're going to see what the Apostle Paul has to say to us by giving us through these scriptures some questions that we can examine our hearts here today to determine where we stand, where we are in our relationship with God. And if we do not have a relationship relationship with God where we should be okay are you all okay with that today does that sound all right uh, I can tell you today it's not something that's made up but it's something I believe God has for us this morning well, I believe there are two possibilities the first one is this they may just be backsliding that's possible that's possible they may just be backsliding. Backsliding, as we know, is a common term which is used many times, which means you're in a spiritual funk. You're in a spiritual array. You're, you're just, uh, you've made a decision, you've separated yourself from the people of God, and you've separated yourself from the Word of God, and whenever that happens, we, we find ourselves just in a spiritual funk. We find ourselves in a place of a backsliding state within our walk and relationship. Now, if it's true backsliding, now, if it's true backsliding, it eventually ends up and leads to repentance, if you've truly been saved and you have found yourself in the midst of backsliding on a slippery slope, I can, all, I can tell you here today, if that's the case, that person is going to eventually be led back to a place of repentance. But if there is no backsliding, there's only one other option, and that is our second point here today, and that is a real possibility that they were never really converted or really saved to begin with. So those are the two areas we have to look at to determine am I backsliding or do I just really not know? Have I never come into that personal walk and relationship with Jesus Christ? They even, this is the scary thing about it. They may, they may have thought they were saved. They, they may have given evidence that they were. They may have shared Christ with other people. They may have attended Bible study classes. and They may have even gotten caught up in the dynamics of what was going on in this place in a worship service but all of those evidences were all things that even an unbeliever can do and that's what is so scary because we can see all of those happening in a person's life but it still not be genuine it still not be real and I believe we need to address that here today this is why the apostle Paul made it so clear here in his writings that the the We'd better make sure, that that's really what I see by reading these few verses of Scripture, that we had better make sure, we had better know for sure that we have been called by God and we have experienced repentance of being lost to salvation from darkness to life. We've got to be certain of that. It has to be something that there's no doubt whatsoever. And even in the most rainy, stormy days of your life, that is not something that you're going to struggle with wondering if this Jesus that I've been hearing about and talking about is really in my life or not. So the truth is we can be fooled. And isn't it interesting, isn't it always the ones, and it seems that way to me, the ones that seem to be the most unlikely to fall away are the ones many times are the ones that fall away. The ones that many times have shown the most evidence. You see, when someone falls away, we should be very concerned because either, either they're in sin or they've never been in Christ and either one of them is devastating so what do we do? Well, Paul says we need to examine our lives according to not what Larry says or your Sunday school teacher says or the president says, but what God says. 
He says to examine what God has to say and follow that. So there may be some of you here today, and let's just go ahead and, and, and throw it out before us. There may be some, and I believe there are probably today some that are struggling with your own salvation. That you're struggling with your own salvation. You go through seasons that you're not sure if you're saved. You go through seasons struggling, wondering if it is genuine and real. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and chapter 7 verse 1, Paul gives us a few questions that we can ask. And those questions are dynamic questions. But the questions that we can ask to see if we really know Christ in a personal but, but a life-changing way. Now, now, please listen up today. Please, please hold on. I'm accused many times, I'm accused many times of, of preaching up here of being too evangelistic because I preach evangelistic sermons uh, to people in the church that are, that are the choir. And, and God has not allowed me to get away from preaching evangelistic sermons to a church that I've been with for now over 30 years. And, and maybe I need to, maybe that needs to be mixed up somewhere along the way and a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that along the way. But I can tell you today, God wants me to preach on what he's given me this morning to be able to stir, to stir the, the big pot of the church today to make sure that, that we know that we know that Christ is most genuine and real in our lives. And because of that, we can say, I'm changed and here's why. I'm changed because Christ lives in me. And I know that without a doubt. So he gives a few questions, and I thought they were interesting questions that helped me to examine my life. I know I'm saved, but I examine that often. Just because I know that I'm a believer and know that Christ lives in me, I'm always wanting to, to check it. I want to take it to the Word and check it. I want to test it from the Word. Make sure that Christ lives in me. First question, did you receive, did you receive the grace of the gospel? <laughs> did you receive the grace of the gospel? Look in verse 1. This is my favorite of all the verses. Verse 1. We then, as workers together with him. Did you hear that? He says that we are workers together, workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain, working together with him. That's what I want to wake up in the morning thinking about. That's what I want to go to bed at night dreaming about. I want to be reminded that the work that he's called me to do, that I'm working together with him. That, that he's there, that he's working in my life, he's motivating me, working together. So if you're saved, if you know Christ here today, you have come into a relationship with Jesus Christ and you're working together. If he's working together with you, you know you have a relationship with him. Over and over, Jesus makes this same call. Over and over, he's made this call today. He's made it to most, if not all of us, in this room. And if you say he hasn't, he's getting ready to. And he's going to use me to be able to make that call. But throughout scriptures, he makes this call. Here it is. Here it is. Follow me. That's his call. If there was one call that you see throughout scripture that's most important than any other call, it's this call. His call is to follow me. So then when we ask ourselves, are we really changed? Have I really been changed? One of the ways that you can see if you've really been changed in a way that God is honored and pleased in your change is who are you following? What are you following? When do you follow him? Do you pick and choose? I'll follow you today, but I got this going on tomorrow, and I don't really want to involve you with this, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you take a break, Lord, but tomorrow get ready because I'm going to follow you. He says to follow, to follow me. Even the disciples, Jesus called, heard those words. Every single one of them, they heard those words, follow me. He didn't preach a three-point, five-point sermon and give a poem and illustrations and all that. He just simply said, I'm Jesus. I love you with the greatest of love. They saw that in the way he lived, and he said these words, follow me. Just follow me. And then the rich young ruler heard these words. He says, sell all you have and get rich. Now, he said, you sell all you have, and once you sell all you have, you come and follow me. 
you come and you follow me. See, we're not called to sit on the sidelines. We're not called to to sit in the pew and just come on Sunday morning and have a pep rally and and gather in the huddle and say, you go, we're going to do this. Good day in the Lord and we can't wait to see what he's going to do and pat one another on the back and encourage one another for another day that's coming just around the corner. And then we leave this place and we forget about even what we experienced here and we forget about how God was working and how he was speaking and how genuine he was and how he lavished us with his love and all of those things and we go out into a world and we do our own thing we've got to get off the sidelines see see that's where the church is so so accustomed we're 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 accustomed to being a a a spectator at looking and seeing what's going on but not a participator involved in it because the bible says it's a call to come to die to self see it wasn't just come on follow me let's have a good time Whenever he said, you follow me, that meant there's going to be rough times, hard times, crying times, sad times, painful times, abandoned times, lonely times. And it means there's going to be times you're going to be on the mountaintop and it means there's going to be times you're going to be in the valley. But it means that I am going to be with you and I will carry you through what you face. I will give you the stamina, the strength, the spirit to keep on going on no matter what happens in your life. And that is the one we serve. And that's what he means. He says that we have to come and die to self. We have to come and we have to follow. I have to follow. I have to follow. If I'm not following him, I should never expect you to follow anything that I share with you today. I'm to be an example like we all are, but I'm to be an example today. And my example comes from following him. Not doing what everybody would have me to do or what they think's best to do, but it's if I'm following him, that example is to be followed and he says it's a call to come. It's a call to follow. He says it's, a, it's a, a call to go and tell, to tell what God's doing. But not only that, it is a call to action. It's a call to action. We, when we become a follower of Christ, and this is what gets me excited inside, and I'll hold it in just a little bit. But this is what gets me excited. He says when we come and follow him, whenever we hear him say, follow me, when we begin to follow Christ, we become co-laborers with him. That's what that verse says, that we work together. We become co-laborers with him. We are called out of this life that we're living and called to a life within to take the gospel where we go, to share it with others. You know what? You're called to declare that gospel. You're called to declare that gospel in the school that you teach in. You really are. I know the laws of the world today and our, our country today, but as a teacher, that's one of the main things God has called us to do. And I know we have to do that in ways that, that we somewhat, unfortunately, have to be careful in the world we live in. But God has called the teacher to go and to share the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and not just in public schools or not just in private schools, but in public schools as well. We're we're called to take the gospel in home, in our home as parents. We're to share the good news as mom and dad with our children that we're called to do that and we're called to take it to our places of work. We're called to be the light of the gospel. Remember again, he says that we are co-laborers with Jesus Christ. In other words, we're on a mission. And I heard this statement the other day from an individual, or actually didn't hear it or read it in a book, but I quote, listen to this. He says, you're either the missionary or you're the mission. You're either the missionary or you're the mission. You're either going and giving or guess what? We're coming after you. We're, we're, we're coming after you with the good news of Christ and, and how he can change us and mold us into being like him. So he says, and I'm to be a co-laborer with Christ. Are you today, are you a co-laborer with Christ? Have you been so changed that when you go out and share the grace with people, they see Christ in you like never, ever before? Paul says this in the very first verse we read, make sure you haven't received God's grace in vain. What what does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what I believe it means. I believe it means it's possible to think you've got it and you don't have it. 
It's possible for people to be sitting in the pew where you are this morning to think you have it, but you don't. You see, the devil believes the facts of the gospel. You've heard this over and over. He believes that Jesus is real. He believes that Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the grave. grave. Satan believes all of this, so you can believe and take it all in vain if there's not something beyond you just saying, I believe it's got to come from the depths of your heart. So we have to ask, have you surrendered your life to this great exchange or this grace exchange. You see, if you're just believing the facts, and so many people do, I'm going to tell you that's not enough, church. You can't just believe the facts. It can't just be something that I believe. You must place your faith completely and totally in Jesus Christ. Look in verse 2. He says, for he, for he says, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. This passage of Scripture says this to me, and I want you to just see what it says to me and see if it says it to you. It simply says, this message has been finalized. This message is over. It is done. Everything is complete. In the fullness of time, Christ came. In the fullness of time, he died on the cross. In the fullness of time, he was buried and rose from the dead. The story has been finalized. Now we're waiting for Jesus to return. We're waiting on that day when he's going to turn, return. And all humanity will spend eternity in one of two places. And, and it's not a question if something's going to happen. It's a matter of when it's going to happen. If you're waiting around for another part of the story, if you're waiting around for something else to come to help you in making your decision, then you're waiting for something that will never, ever be written. The story has been written. You have all the information that's needed here today, right here this morning. There's no more information to gather. The truth is before us today. So what do we do with that? We respond to it today. We respond to it today. And that's what he continues to teach and preach as Paul proclaims. He says, don't wait. I, don't wait till next Sunday to come and get your life right with the Lord. Heaven forbid for you to wait for Easter Sunday to get your life right and come and give him your life. Don't wait for your grandma to be able to be at church so you can be saved on the day she's there. It's so important that you don't miss with anything about trying to, to create the perfect moment to be saved. But when God is speaking to you, that becomes the perfect moment. That you receive him in your heart and in your life. Because he says, behold, now... Today, now, right now, is the day of salvation. So, have you truly received the grace of the gospel? Number two, have you become a messenger of the gospel? Have you become a messenger of the gospel? Look in verse three. We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. A little bit of background. In the church of Corinth, they were proclaiming with their mouths that they were followers of Christ. They were great proclaimers at this time that they were followers of Christ, but their lives were giving no evidence that they had ever, ever experienced any change. We have a lot of proclaimers, but a lot of people that have no example of what it means to truly know Christ in their heart. They were arguing about all kinds of stuff if you, you look in the Corinth and you see they were battling all kinds of stuff. They were going against Paul in so many different ways. They, they, they didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say. And while they're arguing and arguing, Jesus is simply saying, I just want them to proclaim me to others. I just want them to take my word and make a difference in the world they live in. And to remind people that I truly am the way. And I most definitely am the truth. And, and, and I'm, the, I'm the only way. The, I'm the only life that the one one who can bring eternal and everlasting life. So what does a messenger of the gospel look like? I want to give you several things that a messenger of the gospel looks like. The first one is this. They do not, they, they, they don't quit. They don't quit. They never, they, they never give up and quit. Verse 4 and 5 we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience and tribulation, 
in needs and distresses and stripes and imprisonments in tumults and labors and sleeplessness and in fastings. Do, do you reflect Christ in hardships? You know what? You don't have to think back very far more than likely to see if you do because you probably faced a hardship somewhere in your life recently. When pressure is on, you know what happens? The real us comes out. <laughs> and it's the guarantee every time. When everything is good, everything is good, everything is easy. When the pressure is on, it's a whole new ball game. A whole new ball game. Whenever those are, when we're facing and dealing with those things in our lives, as I was preparing this message this past week and as the Lord started bringing people to my mind and I was dealing with thinking about people who have inspired me and who have encouraged me not to quit, who I've been able to see in their life, just me looking from the outside in, seeing what it must be, what they're going through in life. And, and I, I, I was wondering, oh my, how, did they, how do they keep on going with a smile and remain faithful and all that? And I started thinking about Lee and Angie Borum. I thought about them. God brought them to my mind. And I thought, boy, Lord, thank you for Lee and Angie Borum and how they've been such a great encouragement and inspiration to me to be able to keep doing what you've called me to do, God. And then I started thinking about Kelly and Heloise Salter. I started thinking about them and how God has placed his hand upon their lives and how they've remained faithful and how God has been blessing, but how God has used them in ways they have no idea. They have no idea what God is doing in my life through their faithful walk and example with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I thought about Paige Drew. I thought about Paige and I thought about how, oh, over the years when God led her here and, and how we knew that God brought us here, not just because she's a Kentucky girl and, and, and all of that, which that was pretty special in itself, but the fact of knowing that God led her here with things that she has in her life and to see God at work and see her looking to the Lord and, and see her faith even growing stronger. And then whenever I start to get weepy and weary and sissified and all of those kind of things, then I begin to think, God, that's not you in my life. God, you want me to be faithful. Look at those around. And I think about Matt. I think about Matt. Matt has grown up to be a young man that blesses the hearts and lives of so, so many people. I think about Justin. Oh, Justin, how God is using him in so many ways. Wouldn't be surprised if one day Justin is not a preacher man preaching the word of God and proclaiming the word of God. And I think about Canon. As I think about Canon and how God has his hand upon him and being able to baptize him in the lake a few uh, years or so ago and seeing God get a hold of his life. And I'm so thankful for all that. How do you guys do what you do? How do you do what you do? And I believe if I were to ask any one of them face to face, how do you do what you do? Why did you not quit? All of them would say to me, I want you to know God is always faithful he is always faithful he's faithful when the sun is shining thank you lord he's faithful when the rain is falling thank you lord he's faithful when it's dark he's faithful when it's light he's faithful i can trust him see i can trust him i can guarantee that i can trust him just like in these three families i can see they know that they can guarantee trust him and they have, and see how God is blessed. Not only is he blessed in their families, but he's blessed in an entire family and many, many more by those who are on the outside looking in and seeing God being faithful and received in their lives. Notice what the character of a true believer should produce. In verse 6, it says, In stripes and imprisonment and tumults and labor and sleeplessness and fasting. But listen here. By purity, by knowledge, by long-suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, <laughs> by evil report and good report, listen, as deceivers and yet true, 
as unknown and yet well known as dying and behold we live as chastened and yet not killed as sorrowful yet always rejoicing as poor yet making many rich as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Paul was so confident in his walk with Jesus. Can I say that again? He was so confident in his walk with Jesus. Some would say he may have been a little prideful. No, no I, don't, I don't think so. I think he was so confident in his walk. Let me tell you this morning, Sunday school, uh, Bible study classes, if you, your teacher today had been the Apostle Paul and say you were in that class, the Apostle Paul was teaching today, and you have some things going on that are, you're dealing with that are struggles, and you wait after class and you go, uh, uh, Mr. Apostle Paul, could, could I ask you a question? And you would say, I'm just going through this, this, and this. What would you say to that? How, how would I be able to get through this? You know what I think the Apostle Paul would say? Do as I have done. Now, now, now don't, don't let that be something that, well, that's a little bit prideful of Paul. No, 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 no. Paul's whole life was a life that wanted to, to be an example of Christ and be who Christ had called him to be. So if you're asking, if you're asking Paul, what should I do? And he says, I'm not perfect, but just follow, follow my example because my example's Christ. And he, it'll work for you just as it's worked for me. Look to Christ and walk with him and trust him in your life. If people were to act like you, or if people were to act like me, would they be more like Jesus or less like Jesus? More like Jesus or less like Jesus if they act like you, if they act like me? Is your reputation tied to those two words, like Christ? Paul shared it over and over and over, like Christ. I want to be like Christ. We're to walk like victors in a fallen world because we've seen the end of the story. We don't measure today's success or failure by the world's standards that's around us. The only thing that matters is we are in Christ and Christ is in us and the world is not our home. So we won't walk, we won't walk through this world trying to act like the world. We'll, we'll be able to walk through the world because Christ is in us with confidence and we'll not quit because we have been changed. Look in verse 11. O oh, Corinthians, we have spoken openly, openly to you. Our heart is open. You are not rejected by us, but you are restricted by your affections. He's saying we love you even though you don't love us. Paul even reminds them. He says, I want you to know, I remember how you talked about me and how you trashed my name and how you tried to destroy the ministry that God had called me to. But he says, I want you to know I love you anyway. God has called me to stand and proclaim the word to you. Notice our final question here today. Number three, have you experienced the change of the gospel? The change of the gospel. The gospel brings about change. You know where it brings change? It brings change, number one, in pure worship. Not a worship service. Anybody can come together and worship. I'm talking about a pure worship service. Look in verse 14. Do not be unevenly yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness and what accord has Christ with Biel or what part has a believer with an unbeliever. See, the overall principle is all of life is worship. In other words, your marriage is worship. Guys, when's the last time you thought your marriage really felt like worship? Your marriage is to be worship. Your work is to be worship. Your parenting is to be worship. Everything we do is to be worship. And if you've been truly changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ, don't you want every area of your life to reflect the worship of God? The worship of who he is. If you're unevenly yoked, just think about marriage here just for a moment. This is interpreted in many different ways. I think it is focusing on marriage. He says, if you're unevenly yoked in your marriage, how can there be worship? Where one is a believer and one's not a believer. Now, if you're here today and you're sitting here unevenly yoked, that does not mean you go out and get a divorce. 
that means that we need extra prayer and, and, and just getting that place where that uneven, unevenly yoked part is coming to know the Lord, where you're evenly together in a relationship with him. Look what he promises, and, and we're almost finished, but verse 16, it says, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you, you, we, us, are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them who walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, therefore, come out among, from among them and be, here we are, separated. Why? Because we're co-laborers. Be separated, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Did you know this morning that you are God's address? Amen. Where's God? Where's he live? Right here. You are his address. You. If you're a believer and have Christ in you, you have been separated. You're a co-laborer with him and he lives in you. You cannot get away from him. You cannot get away from him. If you're backsliding, this is why you're miserable. This is why you're miserable because you're taking him places that he doesn't want to go. You're doing things that he doesn't want to do. You're saying things that he doesn't want to say and you're viewing things that he doesn't want to view. That's why this morning you're miserable. And if you're miserable, can I just tell you this morning, that is a wonderful thing that you're miserable here today. That there's misery in your life here today. If you're not miserable, that's not good because that means God is not in you at all. He says your marriage should look different. Your work should look different. Your speech should sound different. Your actions should be different. We should be different. Verse 17, therefore, come out from among them and be separated, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. If you're in Christ, you're never alone. There has to be a change. And then I'll close with this last verse, verse 1 of 2 Corinthians. Verse 1, 2 Corinthians 7. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. And I believe that's for today, right now. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Why? Well, perfecting holiness when we cleanse and whenever we really turn it over to the Lord, we're perfecting holiness in the fear of God. See, right belief leads to right behavior. When you're believing the right way, that's why our world's messed up because we believe all kinds of crazy stuff that's ruining and destroying our nation, but it's because of what we believe. We're believing wrong things and we make wrong decisions, but right belief leads to right behavior and the only way you're going to act right is to what? Believe right. We have to believe right. You see, you're trying, many are trying to do better so you can be better. But you can never be good enough. The only way you can be better is for Christ to make you better. That's the only way. Only through Christ can you defeat addictions. And I don't know what your addiction is here today. But only Christ can it be defeated. Only in Christ can you be forgiven. Only in Christ, only through Christ can you receive strength to handle and go through the storms of life. Only through Christ can you have the right words to say. Only through Christ can you make the right decisions within your life. He says in verse 18, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord. Every day I need to become like him. Everything we should do should be declaring Jesus and his holiness. It ought to be how I treat my wife. And it doesn't always turn out to be that way, but it ought to be. How I treat my wife is a picture 
of his holiness. How I raise my children should be a picture of his holiness. How I perform at my job, how, I, how, how I'm faithful to my job and I give back to the Lord through my job is to recognize and point to declaring his holiness. How I treat neighbors and one another. And when no one's looking at my life when it's just only me and God, God and I, being able to see holiness. Today, I have been changed. And I, I, I'm just not ready to get over it. And I believe that God is wanting each of us to recognize and to know that we have been changed. And for us to stand today in our hearts and our lives. And to speak loudly with, with encouragement that God, he is alive. Can I ask you, have you been changed today? Have you truly given your heart and your life? Have you experienced death to life? Do you remember when you were saved? Do you remember, not that you remember the song, the sermon, or the, even the person, the words they said, but can you, can you nail down a time in your life when you can say, this I know right here, I was saved. Not, not that your mom and dad remind you or they know they were there with you and they remind you, yes, you were saved. The pastor says, I was there with you and you seem genuine, I believe you were saved. Not what your pastor says, not what your parents say, but do you know? Do you know in your heart, in your life, if Jesus were to come back right now, that you would be with him? Amen. That you would be saved. You would go with him. There are many that can say confidently, amen, I know that. But there are some that perhaps cannot make that statement today, meaning it and believing it wholeheartedly in your life. And the great thing about that is, and there is something good about it, is you're here today and you can respond to Jesus right now. Why? Today is the day of salvation. Amen. He made it that way. And he's provided it for us here today. Bow your heads with me. We're going to have a time of prayer. And then as always, this altar is going to be open for you to come this morning. Is there anybody here today that would, that would say, I'm just not sure. I, I don't know 100%. I can't remember whenever I was saved, but I really believe I was. I know him. I trust him. I come to church and I worship and I read and all of those things. Is there anybody here today that, you would just say, Pastor, that's, that's me, and I just want you to pray for me today. I'm not going to come back and get you, but I want to pray for you today. Is there anybody here today that you would just say, Pastor, just pray for me because I'm just not 100% sure that if Jesus were to come back right now, I'd go to be with him. Anybody here today, just lift your hand up and hold it. Let me see it, and I just hold it up, and I'm just looking around the room. Thank you, sir. I see that hand. I mean, look, I'm still looking. Any other hands? Yes, ma'am. I see that hand. Is there any, any other hands here today? Anybody else? I'm looking around. Keep holding that hand up if you're holding it up. I'm looking in the balcony now. Is there anybody up there would just simply say, I'm just not really sure, but today I would love to make sure. All right. You can put your hands down if you're holding them up now. I just want to have a prayer right now. Just ask the Lord to give you the strength to surrender your life to him right now like never before. And here's how you do that. You just simply say, Jesus, just be honest. Jesus, I'm just really not sure, but I want to be sure. You know I believe in you. You know I trust in you. You know that I know that you died on the cross that my sins would be forgiven. But now I want to lay my life before you. I believe you, trust you, and I want to surrender to you. And I want to make sure today that you come into my life. So right now, I say, dear Jesus, come into my heart and save me. Today, if you pray that prayer, if you mean it in your heart, whether you raised your hand or not, God will come in your life through his son, Jesus, and he will change you forevermore, and you will be changed. How about you as a believer here today? Where are you in your walk and relationship? Are you a spectator? Do you enjoy sitting on the sidelines? Or is God speaking to your heart like he's speaking to mine? It's time to get in the game. We've got all the info and all the practice that we've needed. We need to get in the game and put it into work, into existence in our lives.